Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Abhimani Lang Singha, fourth year undergraduate from the Department of Computer Science, University of Chapna. Today, as we all know, you have joined with us for the first day of our two day online workshop under the topic Introduction to Docker and Kubernetes, which is organized by the IEEE Student Branch, University of Jaffna, in collaboration with IFS, which is a major software company in Sri Lanka today itself. Um, so, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to warmly welcome our guest speakers, Mr. Mario Fernandu, Cloud Platform Engineering Architect, and Mr. Kasun Kulatunga, Senior DevOps Engineer, both from IFS. And then I warmly welcome Mr. Kandasami Yogendra Kumar, Director of IFS Academy, Mr. Buddhika Hiripitiyage, Director of Software Engineering, Mr. Gayan Dasanayaka, Director of Software Engineering, and Mr. Erandika Logus, Senior HR Executive, who also have joined from IFS today. Then I would like to welcome the Head of the Computer Science Department, Mr. S. Sudhakar, and our IEEE Student Branch Counselor, Dr. A. Ramanan, and all the lecturers from Department of Computer Science and beloved students. Also, I would like to welcome all the guests from the software industry and all the participants who are keen on this session. Now I would like to give you a little introduction to our speakers. Mr. Mario holds a master's degree in computer science, information security engineering from University of Moratua, and now works at IFS as a cloud platform engineering architect. He is the first certified Kubernetes administrator and the first certified Kubernetes developer in Sri Lanka. Mr. Kasun holds a master degree in computer science from the University of Colombo and now works as a senior DevOps engineer at IFS. He performs maintaining the systems with optimizing the delivery infrastructure by improving performance, scalability, and efficiency of the setup. So with this little introduction, now I cordially invite our speakers to conduct this valuable session. Sir, it is over to you. Right. You guys can see my screen? I can see Mario. All right. So uh, you already got a good introduction. Uh, so I'm Mario Fernando, uh, Cloud Platform Engineer Update for IFS. Uh, so about myself, I started my career as a Linux admin about 10 years back and then expanded my career uh, to be a DevOps technical architect. So in my last four to five years, I have been heavily involved with Kubernetes migrations uh, and microservices and many more technologies. So so myself, over to you, Kasun. Yes. Hi, guys. So I'm uh... You can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, uh, I'm a senior DevOps engineer currently working at. Actually, I have mostly my background with the Linux things and the system engineering stuff. And let's move with uh, some the knowledge about the Kubernetes and the token. And yes, so these are the things I have done. Yes. Let's move on, Mario. All right, thank you, Kasun. I will take it over. So, all right, uh, so let's get started. Uh, so today, today we will be focusing with uh, Docker. Tomorrow we will be uh, focusing on Kubernetes. So mostly we will be covering the basics of Docker and Kubernetes because uh, the sessions are short, but we'll try to cover as much as we can. And also we'll try to address all the questions you guys have, right, at the end of the session. So uh, let's talk about monoliths. Before talking about uh, mono, uh, Docker, uh, Kubernetes, it's always better to know what is a monolith, what is a microservice, right? So talking about monolith or monolithic applications, right? It feels like the 20th century, uh, almost a decade ago, people were crazy about monoliths, right? So organizations used to have and still have heavy bulky single application, which handles everything, right? Everything means, uh, let's take a university management system as an example, right? So let's say, let's take the Jaffna University, right? So if you guys have a system already, uh, you, there can be several components like, the student management system, the library management system, the lecture management system, the session, like likewise, there can be several management systems, right? So uh, we used to run this monolith in a single server. So that's why we call it so that that's a huge 
bulky uh, code code base, right? Which is like all in one together. There's no segregation, so that is usually uh, called as a monolithic application, right? So uh, next, this is a, a classic architecture, actually, of a monolithic application. As you can see, uh, at the top there's users, and then we have your components, your process components, likewise, right? So the the, the entire the entire uh, so the, the entire stack is called a monolith, right? So as you can see, we need to implement security all the time over the layers. So uh, they are bound together as a single application. That's why we call it as a monolith, right? Next. So uh, this is how a typical university management monolith system would look like after deployment, right? So let's see, uh, we have, this is the monolith, right? The entire blue box is a monolithic application, right? And then we have a student component, which is, uh, which is a service or an application, right? Which uh, actually is a component, right? Which manages the student. And then we have a lecture component. And of course, the, as a whole, right? It is a monolithic application, right? So let's say I want to deploy this uh, monolithic application to servers. As you can see, we have different servers. These can be servers or virtual machines. So as you can see, it's a replica of everything, right? So as you can see, a uh, single deployment, single runtime, single code base, right? We don't have any separate code bases for student. Everything is bound together. And interaction between classes is most often synchronous, yeah? All right, so next, what the hell is a microservice, right? So uh, it, it's, it's a very, uh, it's, it's a trending, uh, you know, term in the IT industry, right? So uh, several years ago, people start to notice issues in monolithic, right? So if you, if you think about issues uh, which they encountered, how would I upgrade an application without a downtime? How would I upgrade a single component? For example, I need to upgrade the student component without uh, without uh, interacting with the other components, without without you know breaking other components, so uh, affecting other components, right? So how can I optimize resource usage so the application would utilize only the required amount of resources or utilize resources on demand, right? And how can I scale resources, right? So everything is like manually done, right? In, in the uh, in the legacy infrastructure, there's system engineers, right? Network engineers likewise. So the system engineers uh, usually, uh, for example, if you run out of resources running this student management system, right? Or the uh, university management system, we find that uh, there's a memory leak or something, right? And then we need to increase memory infinitely, right? So everything is done manually. How would I make it happen automatically, right? So people found an answer that is microservices. The term micro explains by itself, isn't it, right? So uh, they are what people did was they broke down the monolith based on the business logic into several bits and pieces, right? So let us take a single component like student management system inside the university management application, right? Monolith. So further, even we can break the single component into several parts called microservices, right? So in the next set of slides, I will explain how the student uh, management system is broken down into several microservices. So, uh, like uh, likely we can have a student uh, student microservice. Uh, we can have a uh, backend, frontend, and uh, another microservice for Android, iOS, likewise, right? All right, so here you go, right? We have FE, frontend, backend, Android, student management, right? And then we have frontend, backend, iOS for the course management uh, uh, component, right? So frontend over here is a microservice, Backend is a microservice, iOS is a microservice, right? So as you can see, uh, many small modules with specific functionality, right? So the intention is to, uh, we should be able to upgrade front end independently without affecting others, right? That's just, just an example of an advantage of uh, using microservices, right? So every microservice is a separate deployment, more than one code base. Every microservice has its own DB, right? So right now we just have huge massive DB uh, uh, which is really uh, hard to interact with and it's really uh, cumbersome to maintain, right? So this also ensures uh, module dependence as well, right? All right, so next. So let's consider a very simple application, uh, like an inventory management system for a grocery store, right? So let's say I, I start a grocery store, 
uh, as, a, as, a, as the owner of the grocery store, what I would need is an inventory system, let's say, just to uh, store, I, I have this much of rice, whatever, right? These goods, right? Uh, the quantity, let's say, just an inventory kind of a thing, right? So is it worth it to write a microservice, right? Is it worth it converting that small logical application to microservice, right? So it's not always a matter of, uh, you know, converting all the monoliths to microservice, right? Sometimes monoliths can be an advantage, right? So as you can see on the graph, right? Uh, the complexity is the x-axis and productivity is the y-axis, right? So uh, let's say the grocery, the grocery uh, scenario, the grocery inventory system scenario might fall upon over the beginning of the complex complexity line, right? So uh, as you can see, the more it becomes complex, the productivity decreases, and at some point, as you can see, uh, they converge together, right? And microservices seems to take over at some point, right? But let's say the grocery store expands all over in Sri Lanka, let's say Kiel Super, something like that, right? Uh, they they have uh, they need to introduce not only the inventory management system, right? Employee management system, uh, uh, customer details, a lot of things, right? So as you can see, the complexity increases uh, to the right uh, to the right direction in the x-axis, right? So at some point, as you can see, the monolith, the productivity decreases, and the microservice, as you can see, the the, the productivity increases, right? So uh, the question is, can monoliths be better than microservices? So it's all about uh, the requirements and the business model, the business logic, right? So model around the business domain, deployment, automation, culture, every microservice is a separate deployment, every uh, microservice is DB, right? So likewise, we need to just uh, decide depending on requirements, right? All right, so. Next, uh, this is the most lovely part, right? So containers, right? So we just, we briefly discussed about monoliths, microservices, and next is containers, right? So now Linux containers will come into the picture along with microservices, right? So why run microservices in Docker containers over servers on VMs, right? So Docker can be used to run applications by optimizing resources. The concept behind it is C groups, right? So it is a uh, control groups in Linux, right? Which is a, uh, uh, feature in the Linux kernel. It is a it is a complex uh, feature which we need to discuss in a, another separate session, right? So it's a com it's it's a complex topic actually. So uh, later on, I can share any useful resources for that. All right. So uh, containers, right? So what are what exactly is containers? I have seen some people get confused between a container and a virtual machine. I will explain that in the upcoming slides, right? So a container is something where we, sh uh, you know, ship units of software, right? And it is able to run anywhere, anywhere, literally anywhere, theoretically, right? So for example, let's say uh, in my experience in the, in the IT industry, the same code base, right? It works in my laptop. And when you deploy uh, it in production or for, let's make it simple. If you give the same code base to your colleague, friend at office, right? It doesn't work, right? What's, what's the reason? There, sh there should be some reason, right? So how would I how would I make sure that my code base works every everywhere? Host my, my, my laptop uh, in the cloud servers, in the VMs, everywhere it works the same, right? So as you can see, regardless of the kernel version, in this case, Linux kernel, right? Regardless of the host distribution, right? Uh, it should work. So uh, we can run anything, it can run on the host, it can run in the container, it can run anywhere, right? So that's the intention of having this uh, containers, right? All right, so uh, as you can see, uh, let's talk about some, uh, some concepts about like uh, the virtual machines and the containers, right? So as you can see, we have infrastructure. Let's, let's say that the infrastructure is having 30 GB of RAM, uh, so sorry, uh, 300 GB of RAM, right? And then I can run uh, several VMs. In this case, I just have uh, three VMs. So VM means virtual machine, by the way, guys, right? So uh, in the infrastructure, this is like a server. We have a host operating system. Let's say it is uh, Ubuntu, right? And on top of Ubuntu, we have a hypervisor, right? And then we can, many VMs as much as we can, depending on the infrastructure resources, right? Let's say if we have one terabyte of RAM, then we can run like uh, 40 VMs of the uh, 24 GB, likewise. So if you consider one VM out of this, VM3, let's just consider one VM. 
Inside VMs, we can run many Docker containers. I, I hope that it uh, clears the confusions you guys have, right? So, so uh, we can run many Docker containers. As you can see, we have a Spring Boot app Docker container in running in a VM, and the Node.js app Docker container, PHP app Docker container. Likewise, if if my VM is capable to handle uh, my, as much as it could, right? It can run many containers uh, as you wish, depending on the resource consumptions, right? So I hope this clarifies what's the uh, difference between VMs and containers. Basically, we can run any amount of Docker containers in a VM, right? Okay. Um, all right. So uh, it's a lightweight virtual machine, right? A container is a lightweight virtual machine, in other words, right? So it has its own process space, own network interface, and can, uh, can uh, run stuff as root user, right? So uh, going to the previous slide, Spring Boot app, let's say, right? So the VM will have only, let's say, just one network interface, right? But in the Spring Boot app Docker container, Node.js app uh, Docker container, PHP app Docker container, they they have their own interfaces, but they are virtual, right? You cannot touch them. They are not, you know, really, uh, you know, you cannot see that it's virtual. So everything can be done using Docker, all right? All right, so next. As you can see, uh, it's an isolated process. Share kernel with host, right? What does it mean? Uh, so if I go here, as you can see over here, um, Spring Boot app, Node.js app, PHP app, all of the Docker containers share the same Linux kernel, which the VM3 runs. The same VM3 is running Ubuntu Linux 20.04 something. It, it has its own Linux kernel, right? And then uh, this, this doesn't have a kernel, remember guys? Docker containers doesn't have its own kernel. It is using the kernel of the of this particular uh, operating system, right? All right. So that's what it says uh, over here, right? A share kernel with host. No device emulation, right? So that is a uh, hardware virtual machine. No para virtualization. It's a different topic, uh, advanced topic in uh, virtualization, right? All right. So inside my container, right? Let's say, let's take the student management system. We, I have my code. For the student management system, my library, my package manager, my my app, my data, and it is only the stuff which is required for the student management system. In, in the example which we discussed, right? And why do you really need Linux containers? Lightweight footprint, minimal overhead, portability across machines, portability in the sense which I explained earlier, where I can uh, I can um, run my Docker container, I can run my code base in my laptop. It will work the same in the servers. It will work the same in anywhere in the world. So portability it means that's that. It, it, yeah, that's portability. Empower microservices architecture. If you want to run microservices, if you run a microservice uh, in, in just a, in a Linux uh, machine, it doesn't make sense. You need to run them in a Docker container, right? Because of the features in Docker, right? So speed up continuous integration, simplify DevOps practices, and it also uh, offers isolation, right? Isolation means over here, or if I go here, as I as I explained earlier, we have separate network interfaces, right? Separate volumes, separate process space, separate process IDs as well, right? In the Linux kernel space, so Node.js app doesn't cannot access the process ID space over here. Network interfaces, right? Unless they are uh, they are in bridge mode or something. There's so much of stuff which we can do in Docker, by the way, which we uh, we are intending to show soon. Um, all right. So as you can see, right, uh, to bring up a Docker container, uh, we just need to run uh, Docker. It's the command. Right? Dolly is the prompt, right? Command prompt in Linux. I'm sure that you guys have seen that. Docker space run minus D and the image name, right? And uh, if you want to create your own Docker image, right, there's a Docker manifest, right? It's like a it's like a file which says an instruction file. What I need what I would need in my container, let's say I need Java, Tomcat, whatever, right? So the Docker file, which is a keyword in the in the world of Docker, it's a manifest file which stores everything. And from the Docker file, you can build a Docker image, right? If you need a Docker container, you need to uh, run the Docker image, like in the previous, previous slide. So Docker run minus D, image name will start a Docker container, yeah? All right, so next. Docker demo. Uh, so I can briefly go uh, through this slide as well, Kazwin. 
uh, before the handover, right? Yes. So we have Docker Hub, right? So I, I, I got a question as well, what is Docker Hub, right? So Docker Hub is a collection of Docker images, right? All over the world. If you, if you go to the Docker Hub, you can see millions of images, right? So uh, for example, I can I can upload my Docker image. You can, you can upload a Docker image. You can be, have your own Docker file, build it, push it, Docker image. And your friend can use it from, uh, if he's uh, in a new country, if he's in another country, he can just, you know, pull the Docker image, run it, right? So he can run your software, which was built by you, yourself in Sri Lanka from somewhere else, right? From the Docker container, yeah. So uh, as you can see, uh, there's so much of uh, technologies, right? Uh, Jenkins, uh, Circle CI, these are, these are deployment tools, CI CD tools, and these are source code repositories, GitLab, Bitbucket, developers, right? And we have uh, cloud services, right? Uh, like uh, Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, OpenStack, right? So all of them are used, contributing and using Docker Hub, right? As you can see, uh, in Docker Hub, I can have my own Ubuntu Docker image, MySQL, Node.js, Apache, likewise, right? Uh, about 10 years back, I used to run uh, MySQL, uh, you know, in a, v, you know, in a virtual machine or a server, but now you can just, you know, download a 100 megabyte Docker container and run MySQL, yeah? You don't need an operating system to install uh, MySQL. You can just, you know, run Docker and get MySQL. It's very lightweight. If you compare it to VM, it's very, very small, a Docker container, right? All right. So uh, over to you, uh, Kasun. Thank yes. you. I'll, I'll share my yeah. Sure. I will stop my sharing. Can you see my screen? Yes, Kasun. Yes, yes. we can see. Yeah. We can hear. Okay, yes. So I think now all you have a basic idea about microservices and Docker. So let's see how to get started with Docker. Okay, guys. So in this slide, uh, Mario explained so what is a Docker Hub. And before that, I'll move into the uh, Docker demo. I'll just explain like most popular companies nowadays, they have containerized their products. <clears throat> you can see like such as MySQL, Ubuntu, Node.js, and Apache, like Mario mentioned. So most of them are publicly available. So we can easily download and use that one. So let's try to go into the Docker Hub and see whether. Uh, so can you see the Google Chrome as well, guys? Yes, we can. Yeah. Let's go to the Docker Hub. And here you can go to the explore section and, and then you can see the official images. There you can see there are so many images downloaded, public local images are available. So simply going into the one. So I'll go to the MySQL official local image. Okay. So okay. Here, here you can see the command, Docker pull MySQL command. Uh, so we can you basically see your screen Sorry, we cannot see your screen uh, we we can see you but we cannot see your screen so screen sharing ah, now we are All right. okay yeah. it's, can you? it's okay, okay. Now, yeah. Yeah. let's okay. proceed yes yeah here you can see the command like docker pull mysql command so it will download the mysql docker image to your machine so let's go to the text section here you can see there are some versions available. So the MySQL versions are available for the download. So you can simply download it by this simple command. So you can do the tag like 8.0 if you need to download, you can run this command. <clears throat> okay, then let's go again to the slide. Okay, guys, so we'll see now how to get started with the Docker. Actually, Docker has two editions. If you are going for the installation, uh, we can have the community edition. Then the other one is the enterprise edition. So C is the community edition. And community edition, that is the set of free Docker products. And the Docker enterprise edition is that it is a certified and it will support your container platform. But make sure that it is like uh, you need to pay the price for that if you are using the device edition. So we will go ahead with the community edition class because it is a free and open source platform. 
So by the way, like Docker installation is available available for the Linux and you can run it into Windows and the Mac OS as well. So for this demo, actually I'll use the Ubuntu machine. So that one, so uh, I'll follow up the installation process of the Linux machine, uh, Docker installation. So let's see, so you can see the plus two commands here, right? Just two commands, you can see sudo apt get update. So apt is the package manager we are using with Ubuntu. So first what we do is we update the package, uh, package manager actually apt, and then install using the apt that Docker the media edition. So that's the simple one. So let's uh, go to the uh, demo. Here you can see the third, <coughs> third, uh, third command. It is running the hello world command. It is, it is to verify that our Docker installation is working fine in our machine. Let's move to the demo. Here, hope you can see my screen. Yes, cousin. We can see your terminal. Yes. Here, I have already installed the Docker in my machine. So, if you run the Docker version command. You can see uh, I have my version 20.10.6 Docker is installed inside my Ubuntu machine. So just verify that Docker is up and running correctly. So for that one, I'll just simply run as Mario mentioned like Docker run command. Run. Uh, hello world application. You can see the it is unable to find image from the locally because it is not in my machine. Actually, it is downloading now from the Docker Hub. Can you type Docker images uh, as well, Kasun? So uh, yeah, sure. Then yeah. you can see Docker. Uh, we, uh, we cannot discover the of and, screen. Uh, we cannot see the bottom of your screen. Uh, so can you type Control uh, like uh, Control L maybe? Yeah, okay, cool. So can you type Docker images, please? Yeah. All right, so as you can see, uh, guys, uh, we just down, we, we just ran Docker run hello world, right? So Docker run command, what it, what, it's, what it does is first, it will check whether the hello world container, right? Uh, is, is already there in your laptop, right? In, in this case, in the Kasun's Ubuntu uh, machine, right? So when you run Docker run hello world, uh, it will, uh, it doesn't uh, append a tank. Can you get that command, uh, uh, Kasum, Docker run hello world? Yeah, so as you can see, we haven't uh, Docker run hello world. We can we cannot, we haven't appended any tag over here. So by default, when you run Docker run, it will try to fetch the Docker uh, latest tag. In, so the name of the image is here, hello world, right? And the tag is latest, yeah? All right, go ahead, Kasum. So let's go again to the presentation. Yeah, we can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then we'll go through some basic and important commands in the Docker. And here you can see this command is a Docker pull command. As previously I mentioned, like it is downloaded the image from the Docker Hub or the uh, any container repository. And the other than that one, if we move on to the Docker image, it will show it to you that images what we have right now in our machine. Download the file. So using the run command, we can run the, our Docker image and see whether how the application is run. So let's see, like uh, in this case for the demo, I'm using the VCBox image, and using that one, we can run the Linux command here. So echo is so the Linux command that print what we write here. So it should be print hello from VCBox. So let's go for the demo again. Can you share the screen, Kasum? We lost the screen sharing, Kasum. I need to disconnect it. Now you can see this, screen, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's go for the demo again. 
I need to fully uh, this DC box image from the huh? Just download it to my machine. Now you can run block images again, so it will be shown. Yeah. And as previously mentioned, like if I had the yeah. images command, you can see DC box also downloaded with my machine. And look at the size, guys. <laughs> you know, it's 30.3 kilobyte, right? So if you consider virtual machines, it's huge, right? GBs of uh, GBs, right? But here we are talking about kilobytes, megabytes, yeah. All right, yeah. Then we'll go with the run command. That uh, this is the image name, DC box, and so we can pass the variable to the Linux command here. So it is printing out. So what we are writing here, I'm just giving it. And again, back to the slide. Okay, let's move on to the other side, and you can see there are other commands as well. So Docker PS. What is Docker PS actually? Docker PS view. What are the currently running Docker containers inside our machine? If you run, then move on to the next command, docker ps minus a means you can see what are the containers which ran last and if it is stock or not. So it, it can show it, it will show you. And the other thing is, let's see, like, uh, let's see our VC box is the Linux container we are running. As Mario explained previously, it, it will be a, uh, there will be a, uh, I mean, there is operating system underlying layer for that particular application. So in the VC box, we are running inside the Linux, so we can get into that container and see what are the files inside that. So final one is how to stop a Docker container. Let's go to the demo again. Oh, can't see your screen, cousin. So uh, I just got a question. Uh, what is the purpose of Hello World and PC Box container, right? So it's just like, you can even like embed your own script, right? So uh, let's say I have a shell script, which prints uh, uh, my name, right? So I, I, just, I just package a script and uh, create a docking image, right? So it's something like, it's a very, very simple representation which we have uh, taken for the demo, right? So uh, next, Kasun also would be showing uh, the format of the Docker file, the Docker compose and those kind of things, then you should be able to understand that, guys. Yeah. This is a Docker PS command that uh, that can see what are the running containers. Right now you can see we haven't been running containers. So we'll do something like this. And we'll do the same. It will continue now. This box is a container that we can run the any Linux uh, command. You can see, like, I can pass the Linux command here. So, just to give some idea about you. See? I'll get the other terminal. Okay, just wait for the one second. And it is continuously running. And if I run the Docker PS command, right, you can see BC box is running. That image is running actually. So you will show the status, what is the status of the image, and there will be a container IDs here. So let's go into the guns. So we, if we need to stop the Docker container running, just simply Docker stop and give you the container ID. Will stop your network container. 
So you can run Docker ps minus a to show that it uh, it yeah. all the containers which ran. Yeah. So as you can see, uh, slip sixty command, right? So the first is the container ID, which is which is a unique identifier, right? Uh, it's unique, as you can see, in alphanumeric. And then we have the image, the name of the image, which is there in Docker Hub, and the command which we ran, and it was, it was created and exit status, right? Yeah. So as you can see, the exit status, uh, the first one is 137, right? So 137 in Linux means it's like a kill nine signal, uh, 128, right? 128 is to the power seven, right? So 128 plus nine is 137, yeah? So uh, that's why Linux has different signals, so it's been killed. So it's a separate discussion, but what it means is that, yeah. All right, uh, shall we switch to the Docker file? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, guys, what is the Docker file? I said that Docker file is a text document that uh, contains all the commands. A user could fall in the command line to assemble an image. So if I go one by one, you can see here that Chrome Ubuntu command. So that is for basically, it is the base operating system we are using for this application. So otherwise we can create, uh, we can get another image what we created previously. Then the, uh, if I go to the next section, so you can see these are the install all dependencies for my applications. So it is, APD is the package manager for the Ubuntu. So I'm just updating that one. And for running, so this is for the running web server. So you can see I'm installing Nginx because it's for running the application and just copying my index.html to uh, that folder, rwhtml, and exposing it via the port container number 80. Right? So just this is the uh, press command run inside my Linux container. So it is for running the Nginx service. So using this Docker file, uh, we'll see how to create. Uh, a Docker image and using that one, how can we run as a Docker container? I have already created that Docker demo file you can see here. That one, I have included my Docker file, I show it to you. Here, there are the commands I show it to you. And you see Docker build command, you can see. So I'll, uh, using the minus T, I'll give the image what I need to build. So here I give the name, nginx step, and then when I say the dot command, that means it will get the default Docker file inside my folder, right? Yeah, so as you can see, the first line of the Docker file, it says from Ubuntu, right? So it, it, it will download uh, from Docker Hub, yeah? And then uh, the second line of the command, it runs app get, yeah? And the third one, likewise, it, it continues until the Docker file is over. So here, I think it's running, uh, it is, is it installing Nginx? Yeah, I think, Kasun? Yeah. Nginx? Yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's yeah. Okay, it is built. And if you go to the Docker images, you can see Nginx web is created there, right? So then uh, for running this container. Can bring the command to the top, it's at the bottom. Maybe yes. Oh, yeah, sure. You can type control L. Right. Here the thing is guys, 80 is the container running port. I mentioned expose is the 80 port for Nginx. This is the 8000 is my post port. Actually, when I talk to simply I talk about the container post, it's like a big session to talk about. But here I simply tell like Docker has the uh, Deep, uh, separate network inside our host machine. So it is exposed to uh, the port, port 80 and it is now exposing into the port 8000 into our host machine. Right? So let, let's just run the web engine next uh, image here.
in the next step. That's one minute. I see this running. To see it from my Windows machine, I'll port forward it. So the eight thousands. If I go to the local host 8000, you can see this is the uh, what I printed from the index HTML. So it is printed here, right? So it is up and down. So 8000 means uh, the host code, right? And 8 is the side yeah, like of the container. Yeah. So this is how you expose, uh, for example, uh, you, guys, you, you might uh, run uh, Docker in your laptops, right? And then you can run any number of Docker containers in your laptop, right? So if you need to access that applic access the application inside the Docker container, uh, which was shown uh, like a uh, custom, you can just uh, follow that uh, port colon method, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, guys. Uh, then move on to the uh, Docker compose here. So you can see see here like there's a sample application. So why, why do we need actually Docker Compose? Because the problem is like, if we need to say, let's see like if you need to set up a complex application, so running multiple services, you can see, see here in this example, there are some application. These are the front end of this application actually for voting application, or you can vote for, there will be a web. Uh, uh, I'll show you off, after this demo, if you need to chat, right? And then the result application, so these are the front end applications that can be accessible by the user. And after you vote, then it will go to the Redis and it will save inside the Redis storage. Actually, Redis is the memory, memory based database here, right? So yeah, in memory cache. Yeah. Yes. And the back end side of the worker is a back end here. So worker is process this watch and put it in the PostgreSQL. Uh, it is a SQL like uh, persistent database here we are using. And then after that, result is shown in the web, right? Just so these are like two import. microservices. So the voting app is a microservice, result app is a microservice, something like that, yeah? Yes. Right. This is a really good example for the Docker because you can see like voting app is run inside the Python, right? Python is here. And the other result app, the web is running underlying layer like Node.js. And the other one, we are using the Redis database and Postgre. And the worker is use the .NET framework, right? You know, like if, if you need to run this application inside your machine, you need to install all of these, right? So that is the usage of actual usage of the Docker and into the Docker Compose. So we can run all it together inside our Docker Compose file. I'll move to the next slide and explain. It. Okay. This is the Docker Compose file sample, right? Yes. So this, if I explain this, like, uh, this is a configuration file. So this is in the YAML format and uh, this inside the Docker Compose, you can see all the file services has been put it here, right? So using that, let's see, like simply go through that one. Services so what is the step application one. So it will build the Docker file inside the bot application and it will run inside the Docker, right? That's a simple usage of uh, that one. So what do you need to do? If you have the Docker Compose YAML, you have enable all the things, I mean services, how they are need to run. So you need to directly run the command Docker Compose up and you can see whether all the applications are running. Just quickly go to the demo, okay. You can cap the Docker Compose file as well.
This is the file, guys. I'm going to run. So more than I just show it to you. So there will be like will work command is there, and there will uh, these are like volume is uh, should be explained in IP separately. Actually, so port is as I explained to you. Port eighty is the container port, and five thousand is uh, what is the host port we are using here, right? So we have several services, right? As you, you can see yes. on the top of services, we have both service. Yeah, we can, we can, we can uh, name your own, right? You can even put your ABC, right? So it works. So uh, it's just uh, the unique stuff is like, uh, what image would I use, right? So as you can see, uh, this which is that one, Redis uh, dot, Redis colon, right? Uh, 5.0, Alpine 3.0, that is the Docker tag, right? And uh, for example, a DB, we, as you can see, we are using the Postgres image and we are using 9.4 Docker tag, yeah? So, so this is the, the Docker Compose YAML is something like, for example, if you build several microservices, right? Let's say you have five microservices and you want to bring all the five microservices up and running in your laptop, right? What you, need, what you need to do is, you need to run write a Docker YAML, a similar YAML, which is shown on your screen, right? And then uh, put all the parameters, as you can see the image, environment variables, volumes. Volumes means it's like you can mount volumes from, from your laptop machine to the container because for example, in your laptop machine, you can have different folders, right? And for example, there can be PHP files, right? Say you're a developer, you're a PHP developer. You need to uh, make those files available through a web server. Then you can just keep those files in your, uh, in your laptop and then mount it as a volume to the container, as you can see, right? Yeah. So that automatically those files will get uh, be, be available in the container and then you can just run a web server and um, show it, yeah. And uh, so that's about the services. Let's go to the bottom of the file, Kasum. Uh, yeah, please. sure. We'll go to here, like this. Um, as you mentioned, like these are the five applications these are we are using. Actually, what application and the result application? Yeah. They are the front end and the worker is the back end we are using. That the bit application and Redis and the Postgre is the databases we are using here. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and we also have two two separate networks, guys. Uh, as you can see, at the, at the bottom of the file, networks frontier, back tier, right? So, uh, like I said before, in Docker we can create virtual networks, right? So, uh, I my my I want my microservice. Some of the microservices need to be in some network, and some of the uh, other services, let's say backend, I want my database to be in another network, right? Because I do not want some people, some uh, some uh, traffic to reach the networks. That's why we can. That's why we use uh, multiple networks, virtual networks, right? You can type Docker net. Uh, you can uh, run the compose up command. By the way, we just have five minutes. Until you explain, I'll run this because it, 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 it takes sure, sure. Time. Yeah, we have less like few minutes. Yeah. Um. So can you? Hey guys, go to the network side. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, as, as you can see, the front end network, right? Docker network, uh, you can see it is connected uh, with the voting app, the Python app. So, Python is the base image, right? Docker base image, result app, Node.js. And back end would be Redis, right? And the PostgreSQL as one. And then uh, at the bottom, it's worker. Yeah. So, three services on the back services on the front end network, right? Next slide, please. Do so we you can have, see right. like previously yeah. mentioned. Now, now can yeah. see? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's also we went through. Yeah. Next, please. All right. So uh, before the last slide, let's look at the output of the home post as well. Yeah. I think it will take some time. You can continue, Mario, until that I think. Sure. All right, so uh, remember guys, we were running all these containers, right? In just one host, one machine or one virtual machine or one laptop, right? How do I scale those applications, right? So, and if I want the microservice voting to automatically scale to three containers from one, let's say uh, the memory uh, memory limit exceeds two GB. If I want, if I, if I place a condition, uh, 
if the memory consumption of the voting app container exceeds 80%, I want it to scale the replicas from one to three or one to two, let's say a random number. How to avoid port conflicts? As, as you can see, we were, we were assigning ports, right? Different ports on the Docker Compose YAML, right? How, how can I avoid those port conflicts? How to manage them in multiple hosts? Can you run Docker Compose in every machine? Like go to, you know, I, I copy the Docker Compose YAML uh, to all the machines. Let's say I have a network of 100 VMs. And how would I make sure those, uh, all the machines are, you know, managed with all the, the proper Docker, Docker Compose files. I need to copy the file. I, I need to run Docker Compose up. Make it, uh, make it up and running, do the networking. It's really going to be a nightmare, right? What happens if a host has trouble, if the host goes down, how to keep them up and running, right? So say if the Docker container goes down, it crashes, right? Then somebody needs to bring it up, right? There's, there are in, there are options in Docker, of course, right? We can, we can uh, keep it up and running. Let's say the Docker container restarts, then we can bring it up automatically, right? So there are so much of complications in this, uh, uh, when, when we run, uh, you know, Docker alone, right? So uh, to address all of these issues, right? So as you can see, this is mostly focused on automation, right? Automation stuff, right? And to avoid port terms, those kind of things. That's where we, uh, that's where Kubernetes comes into the picture, guys. So we'll be doing a Kubernetes demo of the basics and everything tomorrow, definitely. Uh, so you will understand more on Kubernetes and how we can map the problems which we face uh, out of Docker, the, the pros and cons of Docker, the pros and cons of Kubernetes and likewise will be demo tomorrow. So uh, I hope it's got the point, right? All right. Uh, I think I'll do the services up and down. So can I quickly go through Okay, that? cool. Can you run Docker? Docker PS, yeah. Yeah, I run Docker PS. Uh, you can see here. My applications are located here. Voting application, worker, and the So as you see, you can see all the ports as well, right? Yeah. Yes, and we can see here like voting app running the 5000. So it needs to be for to my Windows station because uh, Purpose and yeah, you are doing it in a VM, right? Yeah, yes, I'm so but in your case, guys, if you run Docker Compose in your laptops, you don't need to do any port forwarding, it would be available. So you can just open uh, that particular port on localhost uh, awesome, to show that the yeah, app is working fine. This is the voting app, actually. You can have it. Yeah. Another thing is a result. You can uh, at the same time. Uh, sorry, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So as you can see, uh, it should be available on port five thousand one, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a very simple app. Yes. Very, very simple app. Yeah. It is really simple. Um, all right. So, can you type Docker Network LS as well? That's the final command. Um, right. So, as you can see, guys, uh, we have two networks, right? Per voting app, back tier, front tier, like I showed in the diagram, right? Have to do two different, two different networks. And to show, yeah, inspect command. Uh, what are the applications inside this network? Uh, you can uh, Docker inspect the container as well. Uh, this is a typo on the inspect on, on its inspect word. Yeah. yeah. All right. So as you can see, right, uh, on the output over here, uh, it has its own IP address ranges, guys, right? And also, as you can see, uh, there's the, the, on the containers block, if you if you highlight the containers block, Kasun, please. Oh, these are the containers, actually. Yeah, so, so as you can here, see, yeah. So ready is here. One, it has an IP address, right, as you can see. So <laughs> it's not only, uh, even Docker containers has IP addresses, even Docker has virtual networks, right? So. 
let's say if you need to add new networks, you need to do a uh, new port forwarding, everything is done through Docker Composer demo, guys. All right. Um, yeah, if please quickly go through the, yeah. The yeah, you can show Docker logs as well. Now oh, you, you need to type the content ID. See, yeah, you, you pasted the doc image yeah. and type control L, please. You cannot see the screen. All right, as you can see, yeah, these are the locks of that particular container, right? So similarly, you can uh, look at the locks of other containers as well, guys. So uh, that's all right, cousin. Uh, ah, that's it for the demo, yes. Yeah, uh, sorry, uh, we are running out of time actually. So I think we should switch to a q and for a few minutes. I've been answering some questions on the chat itself, uh, but Mario, maybe you can take some common questions from the ones that were shared with us. Yes, sure. Um, so uh, we asked about uh, the difference between a VM and a container. That's that's that was already answered, right? Um, so I'm just going through the list. So uh, one person asked about Docker with Spring Boot, right? So if you need to run a Spring Boot application in Docker, what we need, what we need is just uh, get a JDK image, maybe open JDK uh, base image, right? Uh, and then, then you can create your own Docker file, right? And then you can uh, bundle whatever the whatever the code which you have inside the Docker file, right? You can run those commands and just, just add an entry point. That should do, right? All right, so the other question, uh, so what is the current best career path, right? So DevOps is a trend and it's it's a very uh, demanding word these days, right? So not only DevOps engineers, if you uh, if you learn Docker, Kubernetes and those kind of things, right? Not only opens the opportunities for DevOps engineers, it even opens opportunities for software engineers, microservice developers, right? And uh, for example, monitoring engineer, right? Performance uh, monitoring engineers. So, so there are, there's, a, there's a wide variety of job roles open uh, for these uh, type of technologies, guys. It's not only about DevOps engineers, right? Uh, next question. Uh, so, uh, what is DevOps? So DevOps is a culture, uh, a maturity which bridges between developer teams and operations, right? So with modern technologies and requirements, the need to uh, really software is high frequency. So, Usually some companies do releases like every six months, right? But it's not the case. In my previous companies, I have experienced like we do releases, multiple releases a day, right? So, and the releases are automated. I don't need to be there or sitting on my computer. Everything is automated using tools, DevOps tools, right? So uh, with, with modern technology and requirements, the need to release software is high frequent, right? And also uh, it's, it's a matter of, it's a culture between interaction between uh, the development teams, and the, and the other guys as well, right? So continuous delivery of software is another point for the need of a DevOps. Uh, giant companies like Google, right? Uh, AWS, they adopted DevOps culture. That's how you deliver fast software releases, right? And uh, there was another question, SRE versus DevOps, right? So uh, DevOps is more of an orchestration of an agile lean environment, right? Serving so infrastructure as code. For example, in the world of uh, system engineers, I create a ticket. Uh, I create a. Uh, I, I ask them to create a server. So the system engineer goes to the console through a UI, <coughs> do the network configuration through a UI, which is really it, it is taking such a long time, right? But in, instead, why can't we use code to bring up infrastructure, to bring up containers, to bring up servers, to bring up anything, any resources, load balances, right? So that is called infrastructure as code, right? And if you need to run some commands against those uh, servers, right? We we SSH, we just we, we just we can just run randomly run some commands. But instead, we use another concept called configuration management, where I have some uh, configuration in a file, and then I can automatically run those configurations across 
a farm of servers, hundred servers, thousands of servers, right? And uh, I think, uh, Mario, we can spend maybe one more question and then wrap yeah. things up. Uh, yeah. Um, so one question asked about uh, one person asked about uh, exposing APIs and block storage in Docker. Yes, it's possible. So you can expose the API through the expose command or Docker run the port forwarding uh, the, the port uh, the port mapping command, right? And if you need to uh, mount block storage in Docker, what you need to do is so let's say I am uh, I'm running Docker in my laptop, right? Uh, so the block storage, we assume that the block storage is available, mounted in a given folder in your laptop or VM where Docker is running, right? So then, then you can use the bind mount directive to uh, mount that particular uh, block storage into the Docker container, right? So uh, a similar approach would be uh, if you need to run a web server in a Docker container, you just uh, copy the files into the block storage, mount it as a bind mount. So if you, if you uh, in the documentation, you can just find those details in the Docker official documentation. Search for bind mount, and you should be able to find those details really easily. Um, yeah, so I think we ran out of four minutes later, guys. Uh, sorry about that. Ask, yeah. Yeah, over, ask yeah. for the Docker demo files. So I'll share it. The GitHub, GitHub files I'll share. Someone ask. Yeah. You share. Yeah. Sure. Um, all right. Over to you guys then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Mario Fernando and Mr. Kasun Kuratunga for this very informative session. So ladies and gentlemen, there was a feedback form in the chat box. Please go through it and give your feedback for us. In this time, i like to invite Mr. Erango Kodituaku to deliver the vote of thanks. Actually, we are moving to the end of first day of two days webinar. I take this time to deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of Hyderabad Student Branch of University of Jaffna. Uh, first, I would like to thank our speakers, Mr. Mario Fernando and Mr. Asun Kulatunga. Thank you very much for your valuable time and effort on delivering such a great session. Computer Science Head of the Department, Mr. Sudhakar, for permitting us to have this session. Uh, and to our IEEE Student Branch Counselor, Dr. Aaron, for guiding us through to the end of a successful uh, session. Last but not least, uh, the most valued guest and the students. I sincerely thank you all for kind presence in this webinar. Tomorrow is the second and last day of this webinar. Uh, I hope you all will join uh, with us tomorrow at same time. Uh, see you tomorrow at uh, next session. Goodbye. Have a nice day.